Good morning from New York, and welcome to the uh, live webcast of uh, peripheral uh, intervention cases. And first of all, let me thank everyone uh, who attending the uh, uh, CCC symposium last week uh, in person or via the um, uh, the um, uh, portals uh, of the internet last week. Uh, you can view these uh, archive cases of peripheral interventions at our website, uh, www.peripheralinterventions.org. And uh, let me remind everybody that next uh, month, July 23rd, the same time, wherever you may be around the world, we're going to have the next uh, endovascular peripheral interventions webcast. And uh, without further delay, let me pass it on to the cath labs. We are starting with a few minutes delay uh, today, but um, we're very excited to see a uh, uh, occluded SFA uh, revascularization. Dr. PK and co-workers in the cath lab. George, thank you so much, um, and I, I apologize as well for our audience because I know you were a little tied up and I was a little tied up before we got here, but thank you um, and thanks for the start, the kickoff. First of all, thank you everyone for supporting us last week at the CCC uh, Symposium of uh, Live Coronary Valvular and Vascular Cases. Like Dr. Dangas said, it was phenomenal. Um, and we're going to continue on with the, this case. I'd like to introduce my team. I've got Dr. Jose Wally, who's getting scrubbed, uh, my fellow Dr. Karthik Guja, my other fellow Dr. Rahul here, and, and then our team, Elizabeth, our nurse, and, and uh, Ricky, our tech. Uh, we're missing Ray, obviously, he's away from his uh, daughter's kindergarten graduation. But, but the point is we've got a very exciting case I want to share with you. Uh, in keeping with the, uh, with the theme of what we're trying to do is to try to teach complex cases, and certainly this is an extremely complex case. Can you put up the slide set, please? So I'm going to present this, uh, the, this, this, this patient to you guys. Okay, there it is. So it's a 59-year-old male with complaints of lifestyle-limiting claudication symptoms in the right flag, uh, Rutherford 2, Category 4, uh, on medication, Salazole and Excise Program. His past medical history of hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes type 2, and, and H+. And, and his medication-wise, you can see up there, he's adequately medically managed. He was a non-smoker and no alcohol or IBD as far as the history is concerned. Next, please. So, so his peripheral pulses uh, shows uh, uh, DP and PT, uh, uh, DAPA bilateral, and no, no tissue loss, no erythema, and ABI PVRs were quite reduced at rest. Arterial Doppler showed uh, a, 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 a occlusion of the, of the distal SFA. So I just want to show you the angiogram, and I want to tell you guys, I know that on the history of the website, we had, um, we had a different, uh, different patient listed. Unfortunately, the patient had, a, had an emergency and could not come. So this is just a regularly scheduled patient that, that we had in the cardiac cath lab that we're throwing on. Uh, you know, the patient was kind enough to consent. So obviously we told that there was no inflow disease. You can see here that there's the catheter placed at the level of the common femoral artery on the right. You can see he has a hip replacement. And you can see here he's got, a, he's got, a, he's got some mild diffuse disease in the, in the common femoral with, uh, with, uh, with uh, no disease in the profunda femoris and some moderate diffuse disease in the proximal SFA. Uh, and then, and then at the level of the adductor canal, which is, as you know, where the SFA kind of goes over the, the, the femur, you can see there's an occluded segment of the, the SFA in the adductor canal slash above knee popliteal artery. And you can see here that, that, that the popliteal artery reconstitutes just at the level of, of the knee joint. And this is a very interesting case because obviously this is a, a difficult case in terms of crossing as, as well as in the, the therapeutic options. That's one of the reasons we were kind of excited that, that we actually had this case available today to present to you or else we would not have been able to show you such an interesting case. Then as far as, far as the runoff is concerned, Dr. Dangus, uh, he's got, pardon me as my fellow is giving an ACT here, uh, he's got, um, um, I believe, three vessel runoff to the foot. So, so he, uh, not yeah, two vessel runoff to the foot by the posterior tibial and the perineal. So this is a very exciting case. So we've got multiple challenges in this case. So first and foremost is, is from a thought process point of view for everybody out there, you, you want to start thinking about, well, wh what are the steps and how am I going to handle this case? Well, first and foremost is how, if you choose to do an endovascular approach, obviously you have an endovascular approach and a surgical approach. The, the patient does not have tissue loss, does not have gangrene. So therefore an endovascular first option 
may be okay or acceptable in, in the right hands as long as the patient has been adequately medically managed. This patient, as you saw, has been adequately medically managed, has failed adequate medical therapy, clearly still symptomatic, and clearly wants to obviously have this fixed. So generally, in this institution, with, our, with, with myself, Dr. Dangus, and Dr. Wiley, we tend to go with an endovascular first approach. So, so that's first, so that's been decided. Second is, how can we dissect this, this, odd, this vessel and, and say, well, how, how are we gonna do this? The way we all look at it as a group, uh, the three of us, is one, first and foremost, we say the steps are gonna be crossing the lesion, okay, and crossing the lesion is gonna be broken down into breaking the proximal cap, transversing the lesion, and then re-entering the distal cap, simple. Okay, so, so now let's go forward. So, so, so now we're, we're, we're gonna go to crossing the lesion, right? This is the foot shot. Now I want you to go to the angiogram again. Let me go backwards here. I know I have a shot of it, okay? Here it is. So, so now when you look at the angiogram, this is a focused angiogram of the occluded segment, okay? This is what I want all of you out there to do. So what do you have? You have, up on the top of your screen, you have the occluded, you know, above knee popliteal artery, distal SFA. So when you look at the proximal cap, analyze the cap and decide to yourself what are the challenges that you're gonna have. First and foremost, you have a blunt cap. You don't have a beak. So when you have a beak, if you remember the lecture I gave, I don't know, maybe uh, four or five months ago on CTOs, you know if you have a beak, that's the most favorable cap for you to get into. So, 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 so it's not favorable because it doesn't have a beak. Number two, it has a side branch. So remember, the wires, balloons, stents, everything that, that you tend to cross CTOs with tend to go through the area of least resistance, and here is the side branch here that you have, which is a robust genicular collateral that's obviously giving collateralization. So therefore, you know that this is going to be no more difficult. Three, you don't really see any angiographic calcification. So because you don't see any real angiographic, you might have it, but you don't see it at this stage, likelihood it's probably not that calcified, but although myself and Dr. Wiley and Dr. Dangus have clearly seen cases like this that have fooled us. Lastly, you, you don't see any calcification in the track. So if you have calcification in the track, you know that your traversing of the, of the CTO also will be difficult. So, so, so what, are the, what are the few clues that the three of us can give you to break this, uh, this, this lesion? First and foremost, you need a directional catheter with either a wire or, or a CTO device. Obviously, we want to demonstrate things that may or may not be available out there so that people see that there are different um, um, things that are available or toys that are available to break CTOs. So we've chose a directional catheter, which is basically a vertebral tip catheter. This is going to allow us to move away from the, the collateral and to direct our, our, our approach through to the proximal cap. Second, we could use a wire, but we, we decided to use a dedicated CTO device or, or a, a cap breaking device called the Viance catheter, which we've discussed multiple times. There's multiple available, the Viance, the Crosser, the True Path, there's multiple different devices available. We chose the Viance in this, and I really don't think there's any clear cut algorithm on what, when to choose what. Lastly, so once we've now broken the cap, which will demonstrate the, the challenge will be in the cross, that's where the, the, the traversion of the CTO, that's where the actual uh, catheter will help us to, to, to direct the, uh, the, the wire or, or the device that we choose to use. And the last part will be the distal cap. Now you can see the distal cap also is a blunt occlusion. So the distal cap, and it's at the level of the popliteal, so three things come to mind. Blunt occlusion means likelihood of calcification. Second, popliteal artery means you don't want to increase the, the, the what's it called, extend the dissection plane if you are in a subintimal space too far deep into the popliteal. Three, re-entry may be difficult, so you must be ready to use a dedicated re-entry device if it doesn't go well. I'm sorry, George, to be a, to be a blabbermouth, but I wanted to get my thoughts across. Maybe you and Jose can talk as I start uh, uh, doing this with the Viants. Yeah, well, the interesting part that I had to comment here is that we're focusing on the, uh, uh, on the distal SFA, which is the most important part of this intervention. Uh, uh, however, uh, I want to bring to the attention of uh, the viewers that the entire SFA proximal amid is also diseased. And we're going to be faced with that after successful crossing. And after we try to uh, figure out how to end, uh, 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 you know, this intervention. But let's focus first on the successful crossing. And uh, uh, we see a device that is uh, uh, allowing some advancement forward. And 
uh, hopefully with a fluorophane uh, we can uh, uh, see if it, uh, if it advances towards the distal uh, target, so to speak. So George, what we did there, I just wanted to, you're, you're absolutely right, that's actually a phenomenal point. You have a whole occluded SFA and a, a diseased SFA that we're gonna have to deal with. But with that, with that high mag view, I, as you know, what we normally do is make sure that we direct the, uh, the catheter away from the, uh, from the area of, uh, of occlusion, or, or excuse me, from the area of the collateral, and then are able to work. So here I, I actually you moved away from the collateral, have gotten through, and now I'm just gonna give you a little die just to show you where the reconstitution zone is. Let me do it on the roadmap for you. So George, I mean, talk a little bit on your technique. What do you like to do in these kind of cases when you're faced with them? Well, I mean, the most important thing is to, to create a little bit of an initiation in your, in your intervention. So there is no beak. That's a disadvantage. So somehow you have to use something that's going to sway you away from the side branch. That's the number one important point. And you have to create a little bit of a, uh, a, a, little bit of an entry. And uh, uh, you could uh, try the, uh, uh, you could try the uh, angle, uh, angle and hole catheter uh, with the, uh, with a straight wire, uh, straight glide wire, and see how that gets you. The advantage of this particular case is that the occlusion is not awfully long. Yes. And that the um, line connecting the um, proximal and the distal yes. cap is rather straight. So that, uh, uh, that uh, approach might work. The other approach is to use entry catheters such as crosser perhaps. Uh, or uh, um, uh, you know, uh, um, any of a variety of others to make a little bit of an, a few, even few millimeters of entry forward and then to, uh, and then to advance. Uh, George, George, is there, and when you talk about wires, is there any particular wire you like better than the other with these kind of long CTOs? Are you an 0 and 4 guy, an 035 guy? What do you like? I like to uh, uh, I like to start with the um, uh, 035 glide straight uh, with an angle catheter as a support. Uh, I think the angle catheter is very important, particularly here because it's uh, uh, because we need to uh, kind of avoid the side branch, um, and uh, it may be that uh, you cannot advance this at all. Uh, because the proximal cap is very, uh, is very uh, strong. Obviously, this wasn't the case here, but uh, you know it might be, and you feel that right away. So then you don't need to spend that much time. If it goes nowhere, uh, you avoid that and you start uh, uh, with the, uh, using uh, any specialized entry catheters that uh, nobody expects them to cross the entire occlusion. Their goal is to start you up. Mm -hmm. Uh, for uh, uh, several millimeters, and then again you would continue with uh, with a wire. So you can see here that Dr. Guja is trying to advance that catheter. It's very fibrotic. We might be in the subminimal space, which, like Dr. Denga said, we might be, you know, having that space. You can see it's not moving at all. So what I'm going to do is actually try and just go forward with the with the Vions catheter. And, and you know, listen, like I said, you know, you you have to be prepared to use what's well, what's necessary. If you need to use a, a subminimal uh, a re-entry catheter, and this now I don't really like where we're going. It looks like we're going to a different plane, Dr. Wiley. Well, you it's kind of probably spiraling around the lumen. Um, so it goes a little bit medial, now it's a little lateral first, now it's going a little medial. Right. If it turns around and go lateral. So I'm gonna uh, pull it back maybe. here, George, and try to redirect it. Let me, let me try to redirect it this way. Uh, and then, can you hold it right there, Karthik? Pinch the catheter for me. That's a great question, Jose. We've got the uh, Confianza Pro Wire, and the Confianza Pro Wire is, um, as you know, it's, uh, it's an 014 stiff corner wire. George will probably be able to be the best one to comment on it. And over here, it clearly uh, gives us the support that we need. So the, the various level of support we have is, first of all, we have our, our, our sheath uh, all the way at the uh, common femoral, proximal SFA, then through that, advanced a, um, a catheter for uh, 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 a, a you know a, a vert tip catheter mm -hmm. which is angled and then through that catheter we have our system with a micro catheter and the um, uh, and the uh, crossing mm -hmm. wire. So we're just we reoriented a little bit. You can see we're slightly off here. So what I may try to do is try to get that catheter down. Can you push that catheter down, my friend, a little bit? 
So you can see as Dr. Dr. Guja is pushing really hard, it's quite difficult. I want you I want you guys to understand that anytime you push hard and you don't see a response, that the sheep may be kicking up above. That's perfect, Karthik. Perfect. Yeah, that's a good point, and you know that may mess up the intervention further down the line. So uh, let me ask you: Does this micro catheter? What's the m biggest wire this can accommodate? Can this accommodate O18? Uh, no, George. I believe it's a just O14 wire. This is a strict O14. It's a strict O14 system. So I think at this stage right here, we've traversed most of the lesion, but I don't like the, the, the plane that this is getting into. And I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch out and try to probe with the wire here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and advance the wire here and see whether we can probe. And, and see, Dr. Dangus was absolutely right. We're clearly in a, a subindimal space. You spiral. spiral. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna now pull this catheter out and change to a, a, um, a oh, go ahead and give me a, V1, a, a, a V18 wire, guys. So we're gonna now switch to a, a wire system. So while we did accomplish, you could say, well, you know, why, why did we go ahead and use this, this, this device? The whole idea was, was trying to be um, making sure that we are in the, in the uh, in breaking the gap and trying to be in true luminal. I know Dr. Wiley is one who always says, well, what difference does it make? There's made no difference in patency re results with true luminal. I think one of the reasons that uh, I know I do, George, I welcome your, your thoughts on this, is basically we don't know what the future holds in terms of technology. So, so true luminal entry with the, with the advent of, of drug-coated technology, drug-coated balloons, whatever it may be, may, may be the way to go. So at this stage, I mean, I think it's important for us to practice our, our practicing skills as true luminal as we can. And as you know, it's, it's quite difficult most of the time. Yeah, it's interesting. This, uh, uh, th this case is very interesting. Um, I don't think it matters that much. You made some entry there. I think you're going to elevate now the wire from the... 014 to the 018 uh, wire, 018 yeah. wire, and um, you know, let's see how far it goes. And uh, you know, obviously, if uh, that doesn't go any, uh, doesn't go fully successfully, uh, uh, you're going to upgrade to the 035 wire, and um, um, I think that would be um, uh, the third part of the procedure. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a good point. What Dr. Dagger said, give me a little Dagger, give me a roadmap. I think what George, what you're saying is this is sort of like the coronary wire escalation technique. You know, I think it's this very important in the path because I think you definitely don't want to extend the dissection plane too far lower. So right now you can see we've got the cap, we've got the 018 wire, and we're just going to try to kind of snake it through. Let's see where this goes. Well, that's not it, right? I don't like that. So let's pull it back and redirect it a little bit. Okay. Okay, it seems to want to go in the same plane here. See, so yeah, see, that's not, that's definitely not what we want to do. So now what I'm going to have to do is probably likelihood. There we go. Now I'm going to go with the loop technique here. I don't know with that wire. For that. You don't like that wire? No, no, not not for a loop technique. Dr. If we wire, go with the loop like, technique, I think you've got to go with a 35 wire. Well, let me just get this a little bit lower here. Maybe I'm not going with the loop technique, but I just think that what I want to try to do is just try to get the wire into a different plane. Push, push forward, please. So now, guys, as, as for everybody out at home watching this, now what's happening is your technique is changing. So when your technique changes, your therapeutic options are going to start to change too. So you can see here what Dr. Guja is doing is just gently in, uh, in, in, in enhancing the balloon. See it right there? You pushed, and there was no difference. So I want to go back again and look at our seat just to make sure. I want to just everybody to be at yeah, home. Yeah, when yeah. you're pushing and you don't see any difference, you want to make sure your sheet didn't move. So your sheet hasn't moved. And now you know your loop's getting closer. Give me a, oh, uh, give me a little roadmap here. Roadmap. Well, we're going to reach level 2930. That's when the, uh, the reconstitution is. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I just really want to exactly. show exactly everybody exactly what George, George, Dr. Dangus is saying very, very clearly, is that you really want to try to limit your dye. But this being um, a, a more of a... Uh, educational case, I just want to kind of show our technique here. Now he's just, you can see I'm trying to keep the loop as small as I can, especially towards the uh, the size of the distal cap here. And what, what, what Dr. Wiley is saying is true, and what Dr. Dang is saying is true, this wire does not give you enough support. So what I'm just going to try to do is just advance this very slowly and try to break the cap if I can. So again, it's not going to be able to get there. So what we're going to do here is, we're going to now switch to a glide versus an 018 support catheter. I think a glide may be the way to go here. Yeah, it has hydrophilic coating that is yep. going to help. 
So we're just going to go with the glide, which is going to give us more support to be able to cross. And I want the, the audience uh, at home to... You're using the, the straight glide, I suppose, because this is a, a short segment to transverse. Well, I think Jose is giving me the angle, so... I, angle. I'm, so I'm, let's see how that goes. I think you're right, though. I think the right thing to do here is to go with the straight, especially if you're at home. You don't yeah. have much experience with this stuff. But what we're going to try to do you're gonna loop is kind of torque it in. Let's see how it goes. So now, again, as I was saying, in order to keep these cases going fast, you've got to start thinking about your strategy now. And that's what I want to talk to you about, Dr. Dangus and Dr. Wiley. I think, you know, as far as we know, we're going to cross this, and I, I don't think there's a question on that. I think the question is just going to be, well, what's, what's, the, what's the strategy once we cross? And that's what I want to talk to you guys about. What would your strategy be here now that you're sub minimal You've obviously gone into a, a real sub minimal plane of, uh, of, um, of, of, a great, of a great deal. So the question is, what would the strategy be? You guys can be, or? Dr. Both Dangus? you and Dr. Dangus. You know what, sometimes this glide wire finds its way into the true lumen, so I, I will work a little more on that. Mm -hmm. Getting the uh, oh. angle catheter cl closer and see if it goes in. If not, then you get a... Uh, I mean, my, 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 my thought regarding the straight was that so far everything we used is uh, curved. Uh, so they may tend to go to all this spiraling, um, spiraling uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, locations on tracks, and the, and the straight may give you a little bit more of a straight push, Proposal. and sometimes go through the uh, through the cracks of the lesions to the true lumen. Okay. So uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep it really close to this, and now what I'm going to do is do exactly what Dr. Danga said. You use a straight wire. Give me a straight wire, guys. Actually, give me a confianza okay. here. Give me a confianza. The reason is I, I've, I've got a little plane next to the vessel, George. I'm just going to try yep. to pop in uh, at the level, like you said, and I have a torqueable, steerable catheter to be able to help us help us to get in. The confianza wire, as you know, uh, the old one is, is dinged up, so we're getting a new one. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and make a little CTO coronary curve, and then what we're going to do is just torque it in. So now what we're gonna, so again, I want everybody to remember, it's not that you, you can't just go ahead and do this. It's a question of extending the dissection cap too far, I mean, the, the dissection plane too far into the popliteal. Yeah, would, we would like essentially to, if possible, to not enter beyond 30. Um, uh, because, you know, then you compromise all these various collaterals and then you go into the bending portion of the knee and all that. So, 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 uh, so I want to throw some conversation pieces out there to all of you. Um, first and foremost, okay, you cross at 30. Uh, for, the, for the people at home, I know what we're thinking here is, well, what's our therapeutic option going to be? So what is your therapeutic option, guys? Job, Jose, I'm sorry. So um, unfortunately, we, we're probably in a subintimal space, so uh, the uh, data on the Supera uh, stats is, is uh, it's interesting and may, may be a, a reasonable option. I, th I guess you're, you're already... So you see that now? Got, hold on, I just want to tell everybody, you see the, the way that wire moved? You know, the wire is, is clearly true luminal. So what I want to do, again, just for demonstration purposes, creatinine is normal. I just want to do a, a, a little little die shot just to show the movement of the wire in the, in the true luminal plane, just to know. And just, if you're not unsure, just try to just put it in a, in a branch, you know? Yeah. So, okay, just, just, you know, exactly. The Dr. Dangus has done so many CTOs in the coronaries. We just try to put it in a branch, you know? I'm certain that we're in. I know George is laughing because he knows we're in. But the, but the point is, you know, you just want to try to say, okay, let me go in a branch, you know, and obviously I'm having trouble. So I'm just going to keep it where it is. But that, that may be something I that you may want to try. No, oh, we are in a branch now. You're right. Go, go forward, please. So now we're going to try to cross the, 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 the lesion. And we can't. I mean, no, no, that may be that the, now the, the viewers have to be now mindful that uh, crossing with an 014 wire and having a 035 compatible catheter, that may pose a little bit of a challenge right. in the catheter crossing okay, hold on. Uh, through the distal cap because it's not the perfect match between the wire and the catheter. So, so you got to push so, a little harder so and that's expect what, that, a that's little... That's why you need a fellow with a lot of muscles. Yeah, and you, you know? have to expect a little more force and essentially you have to expect a little difficulty exactly where you see it, where it uh, crosses from the uh, extra luminal to true lumen space. Uh, you got to really push. Um, and um, you have to have some wire support, obviously. 
some bigger wire support. No, and, uh, people in. If this doesn't go, you have to be prepared to have a either an O14 compatible catheter, which we have, or an O18 compatible catheter, or uh, you have to just use a uh, coronary balloon uh, uh, to a uh, monorail balloon to do some dilations exactly there. Get a uh, whatever a three or whatever coronary balloon uh, that is O14 compatible, and then dilate that that part. In a dissection plane. So so you see exactly what Dr. Dang is saying that you know the, the wire is in but the catheter is not advancing so because the catheter is not advancing what I'm going to do is exactly what Dr. Dang has said is walk this out and get an 018 actually an 035 trailblazer is fine 035 trailblazer actually no we're going to use uh, yeah we know actually an 018 trailblazer is fine so so what we're going to do now is now that we're going to we're going to change this out we're going to change out to a story Dr. Wiley we're going to change out to a safe wire so now we've crossed this lesion and, and our plan now, is, uh, as Jose, uh, Dr. Wally answered, is, is to, he wants to stand using a Supera stand. Dr. Dangus, what would you do? Anything different? I, I, you know, I think the, you know, we crossed in a combination of intraluminal and extraluminal. So trying to do a thorectomy might not be ideal, uh, uh, ideal in would, this case. So, so let me throw something out. Would you use a covered stand? A cover stand? No, I, I will not use a cover stand here. Okay, what about a clip, uh, uh, what about that. the drug coated stand? A drug coated stand, you might that might be a very useful possibility because I think that the that the lengths that they come in, uh, 80 and 100, uh, may be adequate to finish the, the case with a one drug eluding stand in the um, in the in the occlusive. Uh, a stenosis. So, uh, so, so my question is, so I think we're all agreeing that we're going to stand. We don't think covered stand is the way to go here, I think for a lot of reasons, right? <coughs> you, so I think, for, so, so what are the advantages? Okay, let's, t let's talk to the audience of, of both of you guys. Can I have a grand slam? <coughs> what is the advantage of using a drug coated stent? What is the disadvantage of using a drug coated stent in this area? Now, why, why using a grand slam? You are, uh, first of all, you have a 018 catheter. Why you don't want to use a V18 wire? Uh, well, well, first and foremost, I mean, we know our plan here, Dr. Dangus. What we're planning on doing uh -huh. is, is ballooning and stenting with the Supera. That's, okay. our, that's our plan. So because that's our plan, we're not able okay. to get anything out. Because that's our plan, right. <coughs> give me a field of wire here, guys. I might be up against the wall. Actually, give me the grand slam. So because that's our plan, we know that the Supera uh, stent uh, uh, is delivered through an 014 wire or an 018 wire. So therefore, that's the reason we went with an 018 catheter. Now, if we're going to do a silver stent, we would have to go with an 035 catheter and an 035 wire. So, so therefore, I think at this stage, what we're going to do is we're just going to check our position because I'm not able to withdraw blood. And then first we have to do, don't push, the, don't push it, please. And we're going to have to go ahead and prep the vessel. So yeah, right you, now- Yeah, your catheter seems like maybe against a bifurcation or something, and uh, that may be a little bit of an artificial, yeah, there you go. You're absolutely uh, right, George, as always. So, so, uh, so yeah, so, nothing. So I pulled it back, and, and so what we did now is we're going to walk this out. We know we're in the, the posterior tibial, and now we're going to prep this vessel. But George, that's the reason we went with an 014. So, so now, but my question to you guys is, if I'm sitting at home, I want to know why Dr. Dangus will, will not use a cook stand, or will use a cook stand here. Or uh, Dr. Wiley. See, well, I think that the using a drug eluting stand in this location will be advantageous for stenosis purposes. Um, it, is, it is not a highly bending point of the vessel, so that's why I don't know that it is the absolute best indication for the uh, alternative for the supera stand you mentioning, which is, uh, uh, I think, probably better for a little bit more distal popliteal lesions. If well, the main lesion was between, let's say, 28 and 35, um, that would be a, a no-brainer. Uh, I don't know what your views about that. Are you using uh, this stand in uh, anywhere in the popliteal, not in, in the most bending area? Well, you know, it's it's so interesting you say that because I think uh, I, you know I've learned a lot. We've been doing a lot of bent knee angiograms, and um, and you know just at this area because you know the disadvantage of what you and I are speaking about is really um, so is really just fracture. 
So, right. so the fracture rates with the with the Zilber PTX were very low in their trial. What were they? Three percent. So, the so, so we have the data, and we'll show it to you in a second. So, so, but at the same time, this is an area where we know there's a high prevalence of fracture. Go ahead, Mike. There's a high prevalence of fracture in this particular area. So, therefore, so, so what we're going to do here is first we're going to balloon the vessel and take a picture. So Dr. Dang said well, we're faced with multiple challenges. We got the distal occlusion and we've got the proximal diffuse disease that we may or may not treat. Um, for those of you who are not at the conference, Dr. Collins had a, had a very good point. What he said was alleviate the, the, the most uh, serious obstruction and see how the patient does. Then the, the, then the panel also had, had different thoughts. Can I have a little die? The panel also had different thoughts. The panel's thoughts were, well, let's check a gradient and then decide inject. So, so therefore, yeah, I think let's first tackle the most serious obstruction, which is right here, and then start deciding. So you need to go a little, uh, a little Yeah, uh, let, me, let me pose a, a challenging question, see what your reaction, guys, is about that. How, what do you, I know that the uh, you know, high-level aggressive atherectomy or perhaps mm -hmm. laser uh, might not be the best uh, so uh, scenario go in this go particular go case that we did a lot of uh, yeah. in and out of the lumen angioplasty. But what do you think of doing a passage with a small CSI uh, um, uh, device, the diamond back, and uh, see how that might uh, uh, smoothen out a few things, uh, particularly in the caps and all that, as an alternative to just ballooning? I think would you I, consider I, that? I, well, I, I think it's a great point. I think as far as I'm concerned, my only concern would be the CTO and the dissection plane that we've crossed. If I was certain that we were intraluminal and there was significant calcium, I would consider what you're saying for sure. As you know, we did a live case of a CTO on the SFA where we'd use the pathway medical, not so much the CSI device. So, so I think that that is an, uh, an alternative, as you know, that, that we can do. But here with the level of dissections, you know, I'm a little concerned about, about should we come back a little more? Little guy, Jose? I'm, I'm a little concerned about, about um, obviously, perforating if we have too much. There you go, I gotta go all the way there. So I would... Uh, so this balloon is how long, about this, 100? This is 100, yeah. That's All correct, right. huh? So this looks like we need a total of about 140, uh, um, 120 or 150 length in order to properly cover this entire area. And you see that was the, the proximal cap that uh, cracked there. So now we're just gonna, we're, we're at around 12 atmospheres and now we're gonna take a picture. I'm gonna show everybody. And what um, size balloon is this one? This is just a four, George. I, I really, uh, I think that the, the, what we need to talk about is the principles of using a supera versus, uh, actually, in our opinion, any stand, right? I mean, I mean, very, very simply, you need to prep the vessel especially well when you use a supera stand. Um, the the supera stand is a, is, a, is a stent that's highly non-compressible. So, so what that means is, <clears throat> if it's a 5.5 stent, it's going to try to expand, and if you can't expand to 5.5, it's going to elongate. So a lot of people are worried about, well, you know, God, you know, when I use this stent, it's going to elongate, so on and so forth. And you remember from our symposium, uh, the data was presented very well by Dr. Metzger and Dr. Walker, who basically spoke very clearly that there was a correlation between between uh, shrinkage of the stent and restenosis and stretching of the stent and restenosis. So it's, it, it technique is difficult. It's a stent that takes a little bit of a learning curve to use, a stent that, that, that you have to get used to using, but clearly you, you've got to try not to elongate it and you've got to try not to shrink it. Now, having said that, now what, well, what can you do to help yourself? First and foremost, in order to place the stent, okay, you want to go ahead if you're going to use a 5.5 five and pre-dilate pre to a 6.0. So we're going to take a 6-0 balloon here, and we're, we're going to pre-dilate distally and, and try to use a 5-5 supera. Let me just do, uh, uh, do, do a DSA, DSA. So, so first, you, let's take a picture. So you want to get like a, C, a, a 6 100 or something and uh, do let's two inflections here. or try to do a 6 one uh, a bit longer and... Uh, so you can see the dissection plane is actually a little bit more distal, and which is fine, which is where it was before. So we're going to have to balloon a little bit lower at the level of the knee joint. And the interesting thing is Dr. Burkett presented a very interesting data to us um, at, the, at, the, at the conference about flexion points. The flexion points of the knee joint aren't exactly where we think. It's not exactly over the knee where, where the stent will land. It's actually pretty much at the adductor canal or just proximal where, where it flexes. And we'll do a bent knee angiogram here to demonstrate that to everybody. So you, off robot. So, so you can see here, Dr. Guja is going to advance the balloon with Dr. Wiley's aid to the distal. I'm just going to mag up and I'm going to show Dr. Guja where we want to go. Like Dr. Danga said, we want to go a little bit past 30. We're going to go to like 30. 
one or thirty two. Thirty two, yeah, exactly. You know what, Prakash, I don't think we, we've answered completely the reason why you would not put a uh, cover stent here. Uh, I got you it. You know, we mentioned about the uh, the the uh, flexion point, but mm -hmm. the other important point is that a cover stent may occlude or uh, uh, obliterate the sural branch of the pop right. popliteal. So if that ha happens, you will never alleviate the claudication symptoms. So you know the uh, sural branch of the popliteal is what feeds the gastrocnemius mu muscle. It's not the infrapopliteal vessels. So you may do a disservice by putting a cover stent and uh, covering that vessel. Guys? So we're just going to go this very slowly to nominal. I just want to make sure that, you know, that he's having a little, little poquito dolor, senor. This is a 100 millimeter stent, 6-0-100. Oh, this is a 6 oh, 100 balloon. It's a balloon, that's right. And that's I'm going right. to try to go to nominal. I, I don't want to dissect the distal vessel, Flora. Show me down. So this is at 4. But, you, but you see the area of the distal, of the, um, uh, you know, re-entry or something around 25, it, uh, we still have a little bit of a width. Right, so that's at 6. So now I've expanded nicely at the level of the pop which is what I really want to see with my, with my Supera. So now I'm going to walk it back and go higher pressure, exactly like you said, Dr. Daniels. So I'm going to walk it back here. I'm going to walk it back where I know the vessel gets a little bit larger. And now I'm going to really try to crack this. And you know exactly what you said. The, the expansion needs to be important. So if it doesn't expand oh, for lo siento. Now it is. Respira profundo, senor. Respira. So that's around 12 atmospheres with a stick, so it's still not fully expanded. This is where the stent really shows its advantage. Because at this level, when you, when you have such, such recoil and, and such difficulty with this, you want to make sure that, 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 this, that the, you use the stent with a lot of radial strength. So what I'm going to do here is I want to just prep a little bit proximally here, just in case we elongate the stent. Real, realistically speaking, give me a little dot just to make sure that I'm not ballooning normal segment. Realistically speaking, you, everybody knows very well that you have a lesion there. So pull, pull, push this forward, please. Okay, that's yeah, actually I mean, a pretty reasonable balloon right here. Let's we'll go up here, get this whole segment. This way, if we expand it a little bit, we'll be fine. And there we go. So we got it, 12. I know, he's going to have pain. So, okay. Now remember that the key is the patients will have pain. And I don't want you to shy away from ballooning and adequately prepping the vessel. If you don't adequately prep the vessel, what's going to happen to you is that you're going to end up elongating the stent. And then you're going to blame the stent. You're going to blame, we're going to blame the, the thing. But the point is, yes, there is a learning curve. But the most important thing that I want everyone out there to do is to prep the vessel. Prep the vessel. If, if, if you have a tapered area, which is very important to remember, if you have a tapered area, you have to accept that the distal part of the stent is going to elongate a little bit. And then once you get to the normal part of the segment, it's not going to elongate. Give me another glove, guys. So, so it's very, very important to remember that. So now what we're going to do is Dr. Guja is getting there. He's going to take a picture. So let's see. We prep this, we prep this vessel quite a bit. 6 so 100 balloon at low pressure distally, high pressure approximately. And uh, let's see how the stent uh, is going to go over the one for one, how stable it's going to be, how it's going to keep its position. We're going to essentially stand from like 31 and a half uh, and below or th from 32 and back. So, so George, you can see here, now we've, we've, we've placed the stand. We pl and now remember the key is if you dissect, you got to deal with it. You, you've committed yourself to stenting this when you go with a six, okay? So now you've ballooned it. And I think it's the, like Dr. Wallace said, it's the right thing to do because we were subinterval. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, and, and now we're, we're, we're going to go ahead and place the stent at the area where, where, where we want it to be. Now, important thing with this stent is it's a ratchet system. So the wire comes back and forth. When the wire comes back and forth, it's important to remember to keep your wire well distal in the popliteal artery. So, 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 so we're going to go all the way down into the pop. And Dr. Guj is going to demonstrate to you where the wire is. Show him where the wire is, please, before you do anything. So you can see here the wire is way distal, right? And notice he's done two things. We, we've made it a coronary uh, fluoroscopy with a high-res fluoro for, for you to see how the stent is being deployed. So it's very, very important now at this stage to place it properly. So Dr. Guj is taking it down. And he's going to take it to the level of the pop. And exactly what Dr. Danga said, 31, 32, which I'm not too worried about. Now I'm going to have Dr. Wally give guy.
So okay, let, so, let's so, see how it opens up. Looks like we have nailed the position. So, so you can definitely come back a little, right, Karthik, don't you think? 32. I think you should be okay. 32, yeah. go a little bit further then. Right there. So now we're going to start deploying. Do you want to do it? So Dr. Dr. Guj is graduating in two days. And I'm sure, I'm sure the, the folks at Abbott are having a little bit of trepidation here. But what we're going to do is we're going to deploy this. So, so remember, the key is you want to go ahead and deploy it without, without elongating it. So the key is he's, he's dropping down. And you want to have very, very short throws. Okay? Short hands. Short throws. Very, very short throws. See, see how he's throwing very short throws? He's adjusting. And now you got to see the diamonds. Keep the diamonds a little bit so more. So this is a little bit of a classic Two way. Uh, let me just say of a classic way of just pulling the the the, the sheath covering the stem back. Cutting, and then the sheath is released. That's very good. Now, now, now I want you guys to focus on the diamonds as he throws here. So you see the diamonds, how, how you're having that little line on either side? That's what you really want to have. He's doing very, very short throws. Don't worry about anything too much, very short throws. You know, if, if you need to use another stand, you use another stand. I want you to see his technique, because actually, you know, I'm pretty- Prakash, you want to show the hands, so- uh, the, It's, the, it's the, pretty it's hard to doing. show both. I wanted to concentrate at this stage. So, because it's his first one that he's doing, so you, at live at least. So the point is, you can see here, that he's doing very, very short throws, and I'm, I'll have him demonstrate it outside. You see what happened right there? Right around 30, stop for a second, between 30 and 31. You see the geometry of the stent there? That's perfect. That's how you want the stent to look entire way. So you can see here, as he's deploying it, it's very, very slow, beautiful. The reason it elongated below is that we didn't balloon as much as aggressively below. So because we didn't balloon as aggressively below, what's gonna happen is the stent is gonna have a tendency to elongate. See, that's a perfect technique of, develop, uh, of deployment. There he's stretching it a little bit, which now I want him to slow down. I want him to not get overconfident. And you know, with all these fellows, Dr. Dangas, you know how they get. So. <laughs> So we're just going to throw it slowly uh, here. I find it fascinating that the uh, that the uh, uh, that the uh, distal part of the uh, uh, introducer, so to speak, of the stand keeps moving in and out like crazy but inside that's... your stand, and you just have to be, uh, you know, to recognize it mm -hmm. as a expected phenomenon. No, 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 um, as you know, in most stands, this. Uh, this uh, thing keeps. Now I want you, I want you to uh, stop is, there. Uh, it's stable uh, in the distal part, and it's only the drift back after the entire stand is deployed. Over here, we see that uh, this part of the uh, device is actually moving along with the most proximal uh, catheter as we release the stand. So right. that's uh, something that you should expect with this stand. But Dr. Degas, look at the geometry here, which is perfect, and look at the geometry here, which is not. So as as an operator, I'm standing next to him. I'm going to tell him to really slow down and really throw slowly, he's, he's elongating, that's an elongated diamond. So you want, you, there, now he's starting to get it now, a little bit slower, and I'll, this is a great demonstration because everybody out there sees Metzger and Walker, yourself, everybody do this, and what happens is they're like, oh, it's easy. The point is you wanna take it slow, and you wanna do it slowly. When you speed up, you are gonna, you are gonna, you're gonna fail in your primary objective, which is deploying this then properly. There is data out there, as we suggested, uh, that we said, it's, uh, it which shows clearly that the deployment of the stent is as important uh, in its patency as is the stent itself. So this is one where the, your, the operator is really, really dependent on, on, uh, on you and your technique. So right there, he's expanding a little bit. That's okay, I like that right there. A Little bit stacked, but I'm okay with that. And you can see we're coming to the end of the stent. So right now, Gosh, you want to comment on the use of the left hand to control the uh, the elongation or shortening of the stand? You know, it's hard. It's hard for us to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have. It's hard for them to show him, Jose. Now you see, he's gonna throw this now. Let me just show him. You need to. Now you need to unlock the last one. Perfect. And he's gonna throw it with the same motion. Same motion. Don't. There you go. Perfect. Now get us another five five, please. So you can see here, we use the five five one hundred. And we went all the way to the distal pop. I'll walk it out. Now you're going to walk it out. So maybe for the next ten, we're going to see the hands uh, uh, releasing it, as we have seen very well what's happening with the diamonds. And as you can see, the diamonds are a little bit elongated at the most proximal and the most distal area. But uh, they were, um, uh, you know, very nicely in the throughout the entire stand. And you can appreciate that now that you can fluoro the entire uh, length. Okay, that's the position. So, so you can see here that Dr. Guj has done a nice job of doing the stand here. Now I want, I want, I want to put another one and I want, to, I, want to, I want to make sure, again, I'm going back to the prep. I want to make sure I prep the area that he's going to do it. Don't open it, please. 
I want to see how much stent we need. So I'm going to look at this, and we're all going to decide how much we want to stent it. I'm going to go a little lower mag here, okay? And we're going to see, okay, let's, let's leave it right about there, and let's just shut her in so we perform good angiography. Okay, now I'm going to do it a non-DSA picture. Ready? Just to measure it. Inject. Actually, you know what? We're pretty good here, George, but I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm probably, but you're gonna, you know that's an occluded segment from 15 down that we just ballooned. So, so, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have to put a stent. So I'm gonna put another 100. I'm gonna go all the way past 10 to that other segment. So I'm gonna balloon that short segment before I place it. So, so could I get a, the balloon again, guys? Okay. Because remember, the reason you could well, say... You, you're going to stand essentially from 22 until like 12 or 13. Well, but I know, but what I want everybody out there to understand is you're not going to be able to land this tent on a dime. You are going to extend it into that disease segment. So if you extend it without ballooning that disease segment, you are going to go ahead and, and elongate the stent. Uh, so, so you mean if we, you, you want to extend the stent to, to the disease segment between 8 and 12? Ideally, I don't want to, but I can tell you that it, it's a likely going to happen. So, so your precision is off with the stent. So that's the reason why I want everybody to pre pre prepare the proximal lesion prior to doing this, whether with the atherectomy or balloon, but here we're going with balloon. Go ahead. Go inside. So just very briefly, we're going to do this and we'll do a bent knee angiogram. I'm just going to uh, balloon from eight, George. And then, like I said, what are we going to go with the prox? We're probably going to end up doing some atherectomy in the prox and be done with it. And then I'll do a bent knee angiogram to demonstrate what we were talking about. Laura? I hate to beleaguer the point, but that's the thing we've learned. We've learned that this particular stent, you have uh, this balloon, this stent, you have to have good vessel prep. All the way down, all the way down, all the way down. Okay, good. That's fine. So I'm going to re-balloon this. So this is exactly 10. So you can see if I'm perfect, I'm going to land right here. Come forward, please. There's a 120 balloon, Dr. Gu just told me, Flora. So this actually, you know, this may be enough. There you go. There's the lesion right there. You see that? I'm going to just balloon it. So since it's a 120 balloon, this should be enough. Cine? Okay, down. So now, now what I'm going to do is from 8 to 10, since we used a 120 balloon, I'm happy now with 100 stand. I don't think we're going to overthrow it by, by 20 millimeters. So, so what I'm going to do now is atherectomize the proximal and then show everybody a final shot. So as I walk this out here, get, oh, open the 55120, please. Not uh, 100, I'm sorry. 55100. So, so Dr. Dengis, I want to talk about a technique that, that we use here. What, as you know, you, you, you do triple A's a lot. If you're gonna, if you're gonna downsize your stent, say you have a long tapering SFA, and you wanna use a 5.5 five proximally and a 4.5 distally, it's, it's almost counterintuitive, but you wanna stent the proximal first, like you do in a triple A, and then stent the distal, because you don't wanna stick a bigger stent into a smaller stent. So here, since we're using the same size stent for both, what, what I'm gonna do here is, is use, did the distal, and then came to the proximal. So a very, very important tip that I want everybody to remember is that if you're using a 4.5, a 5.5 into a 4.5, deploy the 5.5 first, and then deploy the 4.5 into the 5.5, so this way you don't have this large stent cramped up in a 4.5 space, and then you're gonna get elongation again. So that's very, very important. So right now we're gonna go in, and the other thing to remember is, the value of post dilatation is very unknown here. I told you the stent is not, uh, it's not compressible. So the point is, if you're trying to expand it past 5.5, five, just because, oh, it's elongated, I'm going to expand it, it's going to shrink, that's never going to happen. You're never going to be able to take the 5.5 five stand if you, if you elongate, balloon it, and shrink it. It's not going to happen. So therefore, that vessel prep is incredibly important. So you can see, it looks like we're going to miss. Now let's see. Now I'm going to let him do it again. And this time I want you guys to show his hands. You came back. Let's focus on his hands. Four. A little more. There you go. So the typical overlap. Let me see where the wire is. So let's audience. show us what are the knobs up there. Push the wire, wire down. Push. It's okay. Go. Okay. So now I want I want I want you guys to focus on the knobs here, guys. So you have you have two two locks: the proximal lock, okay, and the distal lock. 
when you throw it, you throw the proximal lock first, and then short throws when you throw it. When you, when you finally dis deploy it, you're gonna do, uh, uh, undo the distal lock. So here we go, you s you're gonna go all the way down. Go down, please. Okay, so go down, now take your time and do it slow. You're too far now. Okay, so he wants to flare it, which is fine. Just get the, get the, get the stent in motion, okay? Very good. Pull back. So uh, how, how is the stand deployed? You're pushing a knob there. See how he's push pulling, George? His left hand is controlling. You watch this. His left hand is controlling how far it goes. The right hand is not doing the work. The left hand is doing the work here. Right. Okay? That's what I want people to understand. And the symmetry of the stent is essential, especially in this area. Yeah, okay? very good uh, overlap there. Just a few millimeters. Right. So now I'm going to be very slow. I want it to be very slow and I wanted to watch the geometry of the stent. I like the geometry there. Okay, a little bit stretched there. That's okay, he's learning. I mean, you know, it's not gonna hurt the patient in any way, as long as he doesn't overexpand this. So a little bit more, a little lower, a little, little more. There you go, I like that. That's still not good, I want it more. More. We're getting a little bit better, not great. Now it's getting great. Now I like it. You see that, guys? I want everybody at home to start seeing this. Because, you know, we're having somebody who's just trained in doing the Supera. He's done about eight to ten of these. And you can see, you can see the, the, he's, he's elongating a little there. I want him to slow it down. Shorter throws, slow it down, please. So shorter throws and slowing it down. Okay, perfect. Take your time. Now, I love that. You see that segment, how he's got the two lines on the side? It looks like a railroad track. And right. it, looks, it looks gorgeous. And this is how I want him to remember this and memorize it. I want people at home to memorize this. There you go, a little bit of elongation. Okay, good. Very good. Remember, this is not this is not a race. See, he sped up there, and look what happened. Slow down. Shorter throws, Karthik. Shorter throws. There you go. Beautiful. 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 A little bit shorter. That's perfect. There you go. See the line again, Karthik? That's the line. You know, you know exactly what you're doing. Come on. So George, as you can see, the stand is challenging. You know, it's a good stand. It's challenging. You know. Yeah, just show very. Can we show a little bit? Find a way to at least describe what the releases the stand. Is this pushing forward the 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 gray knob? Yeah. The gray knob is that what's doing it? So it's a ratchet system that allows the stand to come forward. The, and and your left hand controls. Show my hands, guys. No, we understand the left hand. We just don't 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 see very we don't see well at all what's the right hand doing with the various knobs. Okay, the that, right that, hand is show I'm, my hands guys for a second. The right hand is give me the deployed stand. No, just twist it, it a little bit to all the right, all right, here's twist the your hand a little bit to the, the right. Stand. Stand. Oh there you go, yeah, great. All right, here's the deployed stand. So the right hand pushes forward the stand. Okay, so okay. it pushes the gray, that's pushes the idea. The gray. Okay. Okay. Yeah, now remember, that's all we're asking. This is a full throw. Yeah. Okay? That you don't want to do. You want to do a half throw. Please be careful. Slow it down. The half throw is what you want to do to deploy the stand. Okay? So this is what Karthik is doing. With his left hand, he's preventing the stand from jumping and becoming Forward. elongated. That's so right. his left hand is controlling exactly the morphology that you see on the screen now, which is keeping the stent in that railroad track morphology, for the lack of a better word, that's what I want to see in the stent. That morphology is what I want. That's what the company wants. That's what most of the people who do a lot of these want. So now we're going to go up. Now remember, if you're saying that, hey, Prakash, you deployed 100 stent and it's at, it's at 12, you're right. It's probably packed a little too tight. But what I want you to understand here is that this part of, 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 of the deployment is very important. Now, now what he's going to do is throw the last switch and there he deployed it. Perfect. Take it up. Walk it up. Looks like we ended up at like 13 or something, or uh, which 13. is good. Abs which, which is good. Which I, actually, I, I don't think it elongated much at all. Which, is, but George, you know, I don't want people to get discouraged with this because you got to understand that the stent is going to take the amount of room that the vessel gives and expand to that level. Yeah. So if, you, if, if it's shrinking, this vessel is a large vessel, right. and what you've done is you've deployed it properly. So don't get discouraged with that. The so key no. is you don't want to elongate. Go to DSA, guys. And obviously, because you've predilated so aggressively. Aggressively, there's no point in post dilating. Absolutely, there is actually a very controversial thing. DSA guys, let's go a little bit lower, Mike. Yeah, 
Yep. Great. Great. Now let's take a shot here. And I want to do a bent knee. Ernie? Give me a second. Ernie? I think it's a perfect position. It really is. It's a great job here. Sonny? The stent looks gorgeous. Proximally, we have issues. We'll take care of that. I want to show you a bent knee angel now. Go, go to, go to uh, non-DSA. Liz, undo his toes for me. This is very interesting from the audience, and I want, I want, you, I want to show you guys this. Okay. Okay, now go, go, go. Just, senor, bend his knee, Liz. Liz is going to bend his knee for us. Mm -hmm. Lift it up and bend it. Okay, muy bien. Floor? Yeah, bending the knee is easy. Try managing to keep it inside the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the imaging field is uh, challenging. Great, bend the stand helps us a little bit. And you bend can see the way. bending point is exactly around 25. Mm -hmm. More? Between 20 and 25. Mm -hmm. Actually, I would say the bend that the more likely more? to fracture is around yeah. 20, yeah. 20 to 22. Now come down, go right, right. Watch, your, watch your legs, Liz. A little bit more. There you go, that's okay. Okay. Muy bien, mucho, mucho más, mucho más. Yeah, no, no, show, show us the, uh, show us the, uh, yeah, great. Show us the, the exactly. Now, now, I want you to look at the flexion point. Now I got more. Yeah, but. I want you to sit in the corner. Yeah. in the corner. Yeah keep, keep, yeah, keep it stationary there Sunny. so we can Sunny. see. That's great. Mm -hmm. And we need to see the tape. That's perfect. So okay. the maximum bending point okay, is at 24. Off. Now, wait, I want to I mag up. Floor. Now, I want you guys to see where it is. Okay, this is super mag here. All right, let me go a little more. There you go. Okay, this is super mag. Very hard to see. See there. I want to drop the table. Rotate it back, please. All right, we got a little overlap of the other leg, but I want you guys to see one thing here, Flora. Okay, now, Cinny. 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 So this is the stent. You're around 15. Now this is the flexion point. You see where the flexion yeah, point is? Yeah, show us the tape, exactly now what look, number now, is the flexion point. Now look at the actual popliteal. The flexion point is proximal to the popliteal, not at the level of the knee joint, as you can see there. See, if you look at it right there, it's, it's proximal in the adductor canal is the flexion point. So now we're going to take a picture. Ready, Nag up again? At, uh, at 24, though. At 24 is the uh, flexion 23, point. At 23, yeah, 23, yeah. 24. Okay, now, floor. Okay, ready, Sunny? Inject. You see that now? So, so, so the point here is, the, 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 this is a very good, okay, so now straighten out your knee. This is a very good demonstration of where the flexion point is, and so people can understand it's not gonna be exactly above the popliteal at the level of the knee joint of what we normally think. So now what I wanna do is, now I wanna decide, now I'm happy with this, we're done with the CTO, and I know we're a few minutes over, but what I'm gonna do is take advantage of the fact that we started late, and, and just show you what we're gonna do with the rest of the case. So now I'm gonna do I'm gonna go low mag. DSA guys. All right, now we're gonna evaluate what I was saying before. The challenge of this case is that the entire vessel is moderately diffuse diseased, okay. and we we'll have to evaluate why, how we finish this case. So if you see there's just the proximal area uh, to the stent is the issue. So the right. question, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna do atherectomy of the proximal area, and we're gonna leave the the, the, the proximal SFA alone unless there's a gradient. So essentially we're gonna treat between five and 10. Right. About, um, you know, whatever, five and 12. But there is a small dissection, and there's a clearly a lesion that is more moderate than mild. I would right, say. And exactly. further up, the lesion is more mild than moderate, and therefore we're leaving that alone. Right, and then what we're gonna do now, we'll check a gradient, George, just to make sure there's no resting gradient. I know it's not been validated. 
but we do it in these kind of cases and then and then we'll do a runoff let me just show you the runoff now and i'll come back to you next case and show you everything for the sake of time and you can see here that we demonstrated what we really wanted to demonstrate you've got it you've seen us do multiple atherectomies in the past and see what level of atherectomy we are using what level of atherectomy are you using the silver hawk i am you know you know i believe in directional just because we can get a good lumen and you can see here that, that the directional atherectomy will help us the most inject so you can see here that after all that craziness, we're able to get beautiful runoff by the posterior tibial and the perineal, which has always been slow filling, as you can see there. Yep. It's a disease vessel. And, and so I think at this stage, I'm going to let Dr. Guja and Dr. Wiley finish up. And I, you know, I just want to see whether you got any thoughts. Go ahead, Carter, get, get the atherectomy ready. No, I, I, think, I, I think we had a great focused result on this uh, distal SFA. We demonstrated very well the crossing technique with exchange of a few wires. Um, originally with the angle tips and we got very very close to the distal cap and it was a matter of using either a, a straight glide or a minimal tip uh, confianza wire and in this type um, uh, today we use the distal uh, the minimal tip um, confianza 014 wire and we had some difficulty crossing with our uh, uh, end hole catheter uh, over there because of the mismatch and we managed to, to cross uh, with uh, use of the trailblazer and uh, and then uh, um, uh, followed up with a 40 and 60 balloons we really did a great predilation aggressive predilation for for about 150 uh, uh, millimeters in total and uh, we used two stands, um, uh, the special kind that uh, the Supera, so to speak, that is very non-compressible, very resistant for the flexion point that as we see here, and we're going to appreciate it, it's actually at the level of 23 to 24, uh, as you see uh, at the distal fourth, distal quarter of the bone. Uh, you can see the numbering now, 24, that was a maximal uh, bend point. Uh, and therefore we have a great support there. There's no need to post the late distance. The challenge of this case is it's not only one lesion, there are more than one lesion. And after we targeted the distal SFA with the primary lesion and the popliteal, we're gonna now go into the uh, uh, more um, uh, middle of the SFA area. We judged the most proximal part to be mild and the more distal part around 10, five to 10 in, the, in, our, um, in our numbering. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, scale uh, that you can see, um, it was more moderate, and we we'll have to do something about it. And that something in this case is a directional atherectomy uh, that is going to, I think, start now very briefly. But essentially, this is a great result of atherectomy in the middle of the SFA, primary crossing and standing in the uh, proximal popliteal area. Thanks, George. Jose, any comments before we sign off? No, I think that uh, the, you see in the last angiogram that all the collaterals are pre preserved, particularly the genicular collaterals and the sural branch of the popliteal. So uh, that's the beauty of the stent. It preserves those vessels which are so important. And, and so, you know, like uh, Dr. Dangus summed it up perfect. I don't need to say any more. I want to thank you, Dr. Dangus. Thank you, Dr. Wiley. And thank the entire team at Montana, Elizabeth especially, and Mayor Chu and, uh, and Ricky and Carlos. And, uh, and of course, Carter Gujo, who uh, made me proud uh, with a nice high pressure stent deployment. Right, good job. And, uh, and uh, we'll see you guys uh, in July. I mean, Dr. Dangus, myself, and Dr. Wiley have a beautiful case for you guys in July. And yeah, uh, we'll uh, see you then. Exactly. And let me just say the exact date, July 23rd, the same time, wherever you may be around the world. We'll see you then for the next endovascular webcast. Goodbye from New York.